Okay, so uh, good evening or good afternoon, depending what time zone you're coming in from. Um, uh, I'm uh, gathered here today with you to hold the second agent-based modeling tutorial uh, for the fields course or CMPT 898 and also jointly CMPT 394 uh, 858. Uh, so during our last session, I had briefly reviewed some characteristics of agent-based modeling um, that particularly emphasizing some that distinguish it from the sort of compartmental modeling that has lain at the center of our attention uh, in CMPT 394 to this point and, CMP and, and uh, the fields uh, course in CMPT 898. Uh, I emphasize the importance of um, understanding the inversion of model structure that takes place. Well, in compartmental models, we structure our model, we divide it up uh, into categories distinguished by state or characteristic uh, properties, um, perhaps uh, sex or perhaps age, um, and according to stages of infection, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. Um, well, in agent-based modeling, we structure the model. The fundamental structure lies in representing populations as individuals. While in compartmental modeling, each compartment counts the number of people that fall into that compartment. That's the data that's circulating. By contrast, in agent-based modeling, each agent, each unit of organization there, keeps track of its state and its characteristics. Um, beyond those structural differences, uh, we noted the fact that agent-based modeling is scalable with respect to heterogeneity. Um, we can flexibly and nimbly incorporate additional heterogeneity into a, an individual level, an agent-based um, model, uh, in a way that would be cumbersome and often infeasible uh, in a compartmental model. Uh, we can also represent within a, an agent-based modeling continuous heterogeneity, income perhaps, or someone's weight or height, uh, et cetera, birth weight uh, in a fashion that is continuous in a way that is just not possible in an ODE model uh, where the distinctions between different compartments are, are ones of, uh, of uh, discrete uh, characterization. Uh, beyond that, though, uh, we also talked about how in, in an Asian-based model, we could capture aspects of context, um, whether it's geographic and spatial on the one hand, or network-based, connectivity-based, topological on the other. Um, we can lend, lend people context. Um, and often they'll be subjected to several contexts at once. They'll be in a family network in a geographic space, or they'll have a social network, a family network, a needle sharing network, and a, and a social network. Um, we talked about how agent-based modeling allows us to accumulate information at an individual level um, that would be infeasible uh, in the context of an aggregate model. Aggregate models provide us a series over time of cross-sectional views of the population. At any one time, they summarize the number of people who are susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, for example. Whereas in an agent-based model, we can, uh, we can know about the particular transitions of individuals between those states. They may seem a more minor distinction, but it actually has profound implications at several levels. Uh, profound implications in terms of the data to which we could calibrate the model, um, our ability to tap individual level data to parameterize the model, our ability to reason about outcomes at an individual level as well as at a collective level, um, outcomes that may be longitudinal in character. Um, we can capture effects, for example, the fact that a certain segment of the population is frequent flyers. They come frequently. Um, and infected, whereas the vast majority of the population has very few infections. 
we can capture the fact that the, the 100 people infected now are, the, are largely the same, uh, same people who were infected a year ago in a way that we just can't within a compartmental model. Um, it also allows us to target interventions based on someone's history, based on a, a person's biography, as it were, their, their trajectory over time, their particular experience. Very important, uh, particularly as we want to capture aspects of, uh, of, of equity within our models um, and examine more in more concrete levels intervention implementation or, or, or the context of different textured interventions. Um, agent based models uh, are stochastic uh, typically in nature because we're dealing with phenomena at an individual level that tend to be hard to predict. Um, in contrast to the deterministic um, approach normally used in compartmental models. And ancient based models nest, that is, they have a hierarchical expression of context. So we can have, for example, uh, a region within which lies several cities, within which lies neighborhoods, uh, each of which is equipped with schools and homes, uh, and there's family context and homes. We can capture these levels of context in a way that we could compare dynamics from that model against dynamics at varying levels of context in the external world, against the results of multi-level statistical models or data collected at the city level, the regional level, the school level, the home level, and reason about those different contexts. We can capture mobility patterns um, in ways that lead to differential exposure to, um, to surrounding uh, risks or opportunities or availability of resources. Those are some features of agent-based modeling more conceptually. Um, and uh, last time, to help alert us um, more foundationally to those features, we built a model together. I'm, I'm going to go um, go take a look at that model right now, just to remind ourselves of some broad features of it. Uh, that model should be posted uh, to the field site, and I should should actually make sure that it is here. Uh, it was called uh, ABM SAR one, um, and Within this model, we had uh, an overall environment, which was termed main. That's the global environment, the, the entire space of the model. And within that, we had a population of people. What distinguishes an agent-based model is it has one or more populations composed of individuals. And here we have persons, a population of persons who were lent various characteristics, for example, sex drawn from a, a, a distribution. Uh, we could have given them an income or we could have given them a, an age, et cetera, um, an initial age. And, and then each person had dynamics characterized by a state chart. And a state chart, like the stock and flow models we've used with compartmental characterization, it simultaneously characterizes the possible states you could be in with respect to a particular condition, in this case, with respect to infection, the possible actions that can change that state, for example, here, progression through infection, or called exposure here, by completing latency, going from a latent state of infection to a overt state of infection, and through recovery, and then waning of immunity. And finally, as indicated by these icons, uh, this same state chart can distinguish the rules that govern those actions, govern those changes to state. Um, and we saw that there were a set of different types of rules supported in this particular platform. We had some rules that were set according to a hazard rate, a chance per unit time, a temporal probability density, depending on your background, different of those may resonate. 
We could have fixed timeout transitions, which fire off after a fixed time. And by the way, this fixed time to, to sort of broaden your thinking about it could be drawn from a distribution, which might be based on the characteristics of this person. It would be, if so, if we drew it, for example, from a, um, a log normal distribution, for example, uh, we, could, we could do so here. And when that person came into the state, the timing with which they'd be left would occur after exactly a certain amount of time drawn from that distribution. This is in contrast to the exponential residence time characterized by um, a, a fixed hazard rate. Hazard rates can modify over time. For example, uh, our probability of recovering from infection per day may alter over the course of our infection. You could capture that either by dividing it up into multiple compartments here, or dividing it or, or having a change in hazard rate. Um, so those are two types of transitions, a hazard rate and a timeout. A third type is this one here. This is um, an asynchronous transition, a transition whose occurrence, whose firing is, is triggered by, um, is made possible by, precipitated by, uh, something else in the model going on. Um, it's not at some fixed time. It's by the occurrence of some, some action that could occur at any, any time. In this case, it occurred because of exposure from some other individual that infected this one. So each individual, when they are infectious, triggered a, a risk of spreading the infection to other nearby susceptible people by sending them an exposure message. And it's the receipt of that message by another adjoining person connected to them in the network that led that other person to be exposed. Um, look at this diagram. You could be excused for thinking that this is but a mirror with similar semantics to compartmental models. And it's tempting to think that, but there's some important differences. It is true that we're characterizing with respect to this particular condition, a set of mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive states. And in this case, they're arranged in progression. Um, but this is being entered in by a given individual and an individual at any one time will be in exactly one of these so-called simple states at a given time. We can have hierarchical states, and if time allows, I may show those. But, um, uh, but fundamentally, um, it's not that we're counting the number of people in these states uh, who are in this state susceptible or that state. Rather, each person is in exactly one of those states at a given time with respect to this condition. Today, we're going to be adding another state chart they will be operating at the same time. And there lies an, an additional difference from compartmental models. In compartmental models, when we want to capture the fact that someone is simultaneously infected by COVID-19 and by flu, for example, we would need to create a set of compartments that would need to distinguish collectively across them, um, someone's flu status and someone's COVID-19 status. You need all possible combinations of them. This person is susceptible with respect to COVID and susceptible with respect to flu. This other person is latently infected with COVID, but still susceptible with respect to flu. This other person is latently infected by both. Bad luck there. They got infected perhaps at the same time by, by someone. Um, and you'd have to deal with all combinations of them combinatorially. Um, if you had three infections or you want to keep track of someone's comorbid status, whether they have diabetes or not, whether or not they're, they're suffering from mental health issues, et cetera, 
you'd be dealing with combinations. Here, this is not the case, actually. We can parcel out into separate state charts neatly and additively, not multiplicatively, um, the characteristics. And, and we'll see that. Um, a person will be at any one time in one state of, of, of any given state chart, a person will be in one of those states, but they can have multiple state charts to express their presence in, in, with respect to each of those concerns. Um, now we put in this model, each person into a network. Uh, when we ran this model, say with this simulation here, uh, we, we found, okay, we could put people in networks and infection could spread as a result. And here it actually goes extinct. Um, by luck of the draw, it just doesn't find a way to continue to propagate. This is an SIRS model, but because of the bottlenecks and the kind of firewalls erected by recovered individuals, it can't spread that much, even though in theory, it could continue to promulgate, continue to spread, even though a, a compartmental model would tell us it becomes endemic. Um, the luck of the draw is because each person is in one of those states and we need at least one person to remain susceptible, it can go extinct here. And it does. I should note that this depends a little bit on the, um, the, the uh, random numbers here. So in simulation, if we were to scroll down, we'd notice that there's this randomness area. This is in the particular experiment. And we, we want to set it to random seed in general. So every time it's a different happenstance about who is initially infected. Um, and uh, how the sub infection subsequently proceeds. So um, sometimes it will die out early at the beginning. Sometimes it will persist for a long time, et cetera. Um, now, uh, within this model, we also added some option lists to kind of make certain categorical distinctions uh, in the population. And we use those, for example, to create attributes as to someone's sex here, not to be confused with their gender. And, um, and we could define different scenarios here that run the model under different assumptions as communicated by parameters, parameters that could live in, in, um, uh, in Maine here. So Maine had parameters uh, here, and I will, Go open it up, there we are. Um, a parameter encodes an assumption and communicates it from the point of creation to this point. So population size, main is created by an experiment. So the assumptions about population side are defined by the experiment. Big population has a different assumption about parameter size than does simulation and they communicate it to Maine. By contrast, a parameter in person is also serves to encode an assumption and communicate that to the person from the point of its creation. And what is that point? It's the population within Maine. That's what defines the assumption about that person's parameters. There it is. Um, so, this is defining the per, a parameter associated with a person. Okay, now there's many avenues we could use to uh, evolve this model. And um, I would like to use it to help impart some additional um, features of, of agent-based modeling conceptually beyond teaching some of the mechanics of this particular platform. Um, but maybe I'll open it up. Uh, if anyone wants to ask a question now, um, before we dive into the, to, to some more model building, this might be a good time to, um, for me to answer a question. And I'll also use that opportunity to post, make sure that this model is posted to the, um, to the field site 
because uh, I think it is uh, it is not right now. Um, so I'll I'll go do that. So are there any questions about this? Any um, anything that you would like uh, to to ask uh, about the model we've we built or more substantively about agent-based modeling more conceptually. Any questions I could answer? Anyone here? Okay, I'm not seeing, I'll check the chat. Nothing there. I am, for those who would like to grab it, I am just posting this to to the uh, to the site for the course um, it's down there in agent based modeling resources uh, at the bottom and for those who are here for CMPT 394 858 um, I am going to do the same thing here um, uh, to put that in um, okay so uh, again, final call, any questions that I could help answer here about, about agent-based modeling before we dive into some more, some more learning on this front? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm just finishing up the posting of this. If anyone's here for th CMPT, 394, 858, it's now posted in the, oh, it's in the models built in class, but um, hopefully that will, uh, it should be an example models, pardon me. Um, uh, apologies, boom. Um, okay, and replace, yes. Okay, yeah, so it's there. Okay, um, so if there's no questions here, um, I will dive in to some additional learning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this recording on um, my initial comments.